Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls. We're very lucky today to have a special visitor vis visiting Bennett School. And I'm lucky to be able to be the one to introduce her. My name is Mrs. Jamie Arnold, and I teach second grade at Bennett School. Luckily, I have a lot of you in my classes. And today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest who's been doing this program for 15 years, Mrs. Margaret Rogers. Margaret comes to us today to tell us about a famous person that lived in Fort Collins a long time ago. In fact, it was so long ago that she was the first white woman to ever live in our community. Margaret, welcome to Bennett School. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here today. I want to tell you about Auntie Stone, and she was born in 1801, her family named her Elizabeth Hickok. And before she went to school, her family moved to Watertown, New York, and there she went to school, and she met, and she married her husband, Ezekiel Robbins. That's a funny name, isn't it, Ezekiel? They had eight children. And they moved with her in-laws to St. Louis and opened a general store. And in the 1850s, they moved to Chester, Illinois. And he died when he was about 55 of cholera. Now that left her with the three teenage boys. Of the eight children, the three older girls were married. Two of the babies had died in infancy. And she had the three teenage boys and he left them independently wealthy. And he moved, she moved back to Watertown with her boys. You don't go back to where your folks are when you got gray hair. You're too old to have somebody boss you and you're too old to blend in. And we're not exactly sure why, but she went to St. Paul, Minnesota. And there she met and she married the Honorable <coughs> Lewis Stone. We think he was a retired judge. Now he was running a hotel and a cafe, and she was a very good cook, so it worked out just fine. Uh, I'm going to talk about 1862 when we had a civil war. That meant that in our own country, people were fighting about whether or not there should be slaves, and of course, the North said there shouldn't be anybody slave. And the South said, oh, we've got so many slaves working on the plantations and the farms, and we don't want to give them up. And it got so bad, they went to war inside the United States against themselves. Well, the Indians, Dakota Indians, saw that there were no men left at home. There were the old women the old men and the women and children, and they decided they're going to get their country back. So the Dakota Indians under Little Bear massacred 770 people in one year in the state of Minnesota. And everybody left. They left in droves. And Elizabeth and Lewis Stone left with them. And they took a paddle boat down to St. Louis and when they got to St. Louis, her family and her friends were just as divided over the question of slavery. It was a soldier's town by now, and they didn't want to stay there. They were uncomfortable. So they bought a Conestoga wagon, and they're going to go west. They don't know where west. They're just going to go west. And instead of having it pulled with oxen, Elizabeth had hers pulled with milk cows. She would milk in the morning and put the milk in the wagon. And then with the bumping along those old rutted roads, she had butter at nighttime. And it was very good butter, and she could sell it on the way. And when they got to Denver and he decided that was where they were going to stay, they had been four months in that wagon, and she was so happy to get out of it, she cried. He built a restaurant. And she was doing the cooking. Now we're going to go back to the port. And Dr. Timothy Smith was the soldier's 
doctor, and the soldiers were stationed in the fort. And he'd had mining business, business with Lewis Stone, and he had eaten some of Auntie's good cooking. And there had been a bad flood down the Pooter. This is June 1864, and it flooded out where the soldiers were living. And Colonel Collins, who was in charge of the military territory, asked that they find a new place. In fact, he ordered them to find a new place. So that river, that Cooter River that flooded out the campsite, was a whole mile wide as it come down through La Porte. And it was so bad, and the soldiers were living in tents, and they could run up on the hogbacks and be safe. But the officers, they were living in cabins, and the water was moving the cabins right down the river, and it was going so fast they couldn't open the door. So they climbed up the chimney, and they sat on the roof, and the soldiers laughed to see their officers go floating down the river, sitting on the roofs of their cabins. Oh, that was a bad flood. Well, they decided the new place, Lieutenant Holm and some of his men went to find a new place. And Colonel Collins said it had to be up high so it wouldn't flood so easy. And the officers' army situation camp had been put right in the midst of people in the port. He didn't want a place where there's any people. And of course, the hogbacks, the mountains around there, they couldn't see if the Indians were coming. They couldn't look around the hogback. So he said he didn't want any mountains about it. So what they found was now it abuts what we call Old Town. Do you know where Jefferson Street is? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, it's the north side of Jefferson Street to the Poudre River. And then on College Avenue, it wasn't there then, but it, you know where the old light plant is? Mm -hmm. All right, it was about 500 feet east of College Avenue, about where the light plant is, and it crossed over to Chestnut Street. And that was where the fort was originally. Now, when I first came to Fort Collins, oh, I loved it. I thought it was so nice. You know, the air was so clear. You could see forever. And it was one of those things that I thought I could just take a quick hike to the mountains, you know, the hogbacks that you can see. I found out there wasn't any quick hikes. They were farther away than I thought they were. It worked. So I loved it. The river, the Poudre River, it was so clean and so clear. You could see the fish swimming. But you know, there wasn't any trees here. Uh-uh, there was no trees here. There was some cottonwoods and some brush down by the Poudre River, but there wasn't any trees. All these trees you see are hand planted. But I thought it was lovely. But Lieutenant Holm now, he's coming from back east. He's riding horseback. And when he got to Fort Kearney, Nebraska, he said that was the dirtiest place he'd ever been. He didn't like Fort Kearney. And they said, well, now you wait till you get to Julesburg, Colorado. You'll like Julesburg. And when he got to Julesburg, he said, that's worse than Fort Kearney. Now, there's some people you can't please. I don't care how hard you try. So they said, oh, come on now. You wait. You get to Fort Collins. That's the jewel of the prairie. When he got to Fort Collins, he didn't like it. He sat down, and he wrote his folks, and he said, dear folks, I'm as far away from nowhere as a man can get. There's nothing here but gopher holes. <laughs> well, let me ha tell you about a wagon, or a wedding, not a wagon, excuse me. What do you think I'm thinking of? Let me tell you about a wedding that happened a couple years before I got here. You know, the first settlers came as scouts, and they followed the trails the big animals made, the buffalo. And there was the scouts and the hunters and the gold seekers. And they would come and go through this area. And maybe some of them would stay at the time. Maybe some of them went to California and come back. 
but there was about 150 men living in the Lafort area. And that was before the ladies were here. Now there was three ladies, Mrs. John Coy, Mrs. Virginia Slade, and uh, Mrs. Will Taylor. Her husband ran the stage station in Lafort. So if the men wanted to get married, they had to marry the Indian girls. And some of them were real pretty, but they're also very shy. Well, this one time between Christmas and New Year's, a young French Canadian named Louis Cyr, capital C Y R, he wanted to marry the Indian daughter of Suey Lewis, and three times between Christmas and New Year's, he rode by horseback that long way from the fort, way over to Sherwood. And later it was called Pimlet. And when he got there, Jesse was gone, Jesse Sherwood. He was in Denver for the holidays. So F.W. said, hey, what do you want my brother for? And Louis says, I want to get married. And my bride-to-be is so scared, she isn't going to marry me unless it happens pretty soon. And F.W. said, oh, if that's all you want, I can marry you. They get on horseback, and they start out. Louis looked back and he said, hey, where's your Bible? F.W. didn't have a Bible. But he got off his horse, went back in the house, and got a great big bound book of Shakespeare, and got back on his horse, and that satisfied the bridegroom. But when they got to the bride's home, they couldn't find her. She was so scared she was hiding under a pile of furs in the corner. It <laughs> took her mother to find her. And that wedding ceremony was one whole hour long. But it must have been a good one because there never was a divorce. And while I'm in the port, let me tell you about Judge Howard. Now, Judge Howard is a smart man. He's a brilliant man. He's a judge. He's a drunk. And he'd sit on his bench there in the port, and he would have decisions made for trials that were terrible. And people got so cross at him, they decided they're going to have a trial for him. So they did. They appointed somebody to be judge. And lo and behold, when the witnesses came, all of them told the truth. Nobody had to lie. And at the end of the day, the pretend or play like judge said to Judge Howard, Judge Howard, I sentence you to be tied to a wagon wheel, fed nothing but whiskey until you die. And they did. They tied him to the wheel of one of these great big wagons, and some wag would push the wagon, and he'd go sideways, upside down, and yell, scream, holler. <gasps> but he was stone cold sober at midnight when they cut him down. Well, let me tell you something else he did. He would listen to keyholes. You're not going to hear a thing good about yourself if you listen at keyholes. He went down to the stage station, and he went in. He bought a dozen brown eggs in a brown paper bag. He went out, and he closed the door, and he's listening to see what they're saying about him inside. Well, a stage driver came around from Virginia Dale, and he's seen him, and he says, I'm going to fix him. So he went around the back of the stage station and went inside the door. And then a very loud voice, he said, did you hear what I heard about Judge Howard? I heard he ran away with a miner's wife and stole his blind seven mule to boot. Well, Judge Howard opened the door. He ran in, and he slammed his hand on the counter. I never did any such thing. Eggs. He broke all the eggs. <laughs> oh. yeah. Well, you've heard about Chief Friday. Let me tell you about Chief Friday. When he was a little boy, about six, now he belonged to the Arapaho tribe. They were living in Santa Fe, and they had decided in the fall that they were going to go to the Midwest, and they're following the Cimarron River up the Santa Fe Trail. Well, you know, you kids, you run ahead of us. We adults are too slow for you. You chase the rabbits or the butterflies. You push your best buddy into the river. Or maybe you jump in yourself. But by the end of the day, everybody had been picked up by their parents except 
one little boy. And he's sitting on a big rock and he's waiting and it's getting dark, it's supper time. The last old man's coming down the trail. And he said, hey, where's my folks? And the old man said, well, some of them thought it would be too cold to stay in the mountains in the winter time. They turned around and they went back. But if you hurry, you can catch them. Dark, supper time. But he started out on the run. The sand held their footprints, you know, right along the river. He was doing fine. Great big old wind come up and just whipped footprints off. And every time he got away from the river, he didn't have anything to drink, and he was old enough to know how to take care of himself, eating berries. It was seven days he was trying to find somebody or some way out, and he was hallucinating, having bad dreams. And he knew he was going to die. And he laid down under a scrub brush, and <laughs> he was crying. He really was crying. But you know, it's a good thing he was. Because Mr. Fitzpatrick is coming up that Santa Fe Trail, and he's ahead of a cattle drive. And he has to find places for the cattle where they can stay. And I can imagine him that night, you know. He's got his campfire going and his pot of beans and his coffee. He's stirring his beans and he says, coyotes sound awful funny. They just don't sound right. And after a little bit, I got to go see. And he did. And he went and he found the boy, named him Friday, took him with him to St. Louis, and put him in school there. Well, the Arapaho Indians, when Friday was about 15, found out where he was and they wanted him back. His dad was chief of the Arapaho tribe, and the old man is not going to be there much longer, and they want Friday back with them. Well, Friday said, no way. Well, he'd been sleeping in sheets. Indians don't sleep in sheets. He'd been eating with silverware, and Indians don't eat with silverware. He's 15 years old, and the girls are pretty. He didn't want to leave. So you know what? Mr. Fitzpatrick said, look, it's real important that you go back. And if you don't want to stay, he says, I'll go with you. And if you don't want to stay, I promise I'll bring you right back. So he did. He came to this area where the Arapaho were. And they had campfires and parties. They gave him ponies. And the girls were pretty here, too. And he became the chief of the Arapaho when our little town was growing up. And they called him an apple Indian because he didn't know if he was red or white. There were, were no Indian uprisings here because of Chief Friday, but we did have one man by the name of Mr. Bassett. He was so scared of Indians. He's a flatlander from back east, and he'd be riding in the Laporte area and going around, riding on his horse and going around the curves, and he's watching to see if there's any Indians, and he's watching over here to see if there's any Indians. And I swear, if he thought an Indian could be under a rock, he'd have lifted a rock to look and see if there was an Indian there. <laughs> well, this one morning, the Indian squaws, I told you there were only Indian ladies. The Indian squaws were out along the, the river, the Poudre River there in the port area. They're picking berries. And so he rides along, and suddenly he sees them. And he doesn't even stop to look to see their ladies, Indian squaws. He gets on his horse, and he goes riding back to where the soldiers are. And he says, the Indians are here, the Indians are here, the Indians are here. And he goes up and he tells the soldiers, they get their muskets loaded, they get on horseback, they go down to do battle with the Indians. Ladies. So lo and behold, the captain said, let's go up in the hog backs and we'll fire off our guns. Well, people that... Mr. Bassett didn't scare, then thought that the soldiers were fighting the Indians. So they came down to where the soldiers were and stayed with the soldiers. Mr. White had a sod house, one built out of dirt and grass, and nothing but a door and a window big enough to put the muzzle of his rifle in. 
and he stayed all night waiting for the Indians, and the next morning they found out it was just Mr. Bassett being scared of his own shadow. <laughs> now let me tell you one more short story about Indians. Did you or your folks hear the gentleman talk last night? He was the engineer of the train that went through Kansas and then Denver and come back up here. And he was telling the story that the Indians thought that the telegraph wires, not telephone, but telegraph wires, had words in them. And they thought they were dangerous. So they would take their tomahawks and they'd break down a line and they'd cut those wires in little tiny one-inch pieces, cut up all the words. And this train engineer said, if you was driving the train and you was coming to a curve, you especially watched. And he said he looked up and there was no telegraph wire. It had been cut. So he knew the Indians were close. And he said as he went around this curve, oh, there was big sunflowers on this side and big sunflowers on that side. And there was 50 Indians hiding behind them on this side and 50 Indians on that side. And they tied their lariats together. Now, that's like jump ropes. They tied them together, and they're going to lasso the train. They're going to stop it. But, of course, the train just went right straight through it and broke up the lasso and sent Indians flying all over the place. <laughs> well, you children, have you had trouble walking in the wind this winter? I think it has been so hard. Do you know that the north wind is called Boreas, and that comes in from the Cheyenne area. And old Boreas blew through town one morning. <gasps> the odometer over at the college broke at 70 miles an hour. It lifted tin roofs off a building. But the thing they did that it did that was so funny, you know, right down on the corner of Mountain and College where it makes a point, well, they had the store right there on the point, and then right behind it was a butcher shop. Charles Evans and uh, Thoman Freeman owned that butcher shop. And what they did there was right there in town, they slaughtered the cattle, they cut the hides off of them, and then they cut the meat up to sell in the store. Well, when they cut the hides off the cattle, they cut them right down so that when it laid on the fence, you could see all four legs, and you could see the tail, and the tail had a tassel on it. Well, this one time when that wind come in, old Boreas come in, really blowing everything loose, there was five cow hides on that fence, and it picked them all up, and they're going down College Avenue, floating down College <laughs> Avenue. Well, Mr. Evans knew that was money that was getting away, so he ran out of his store, and he's going to grab the tassel on the cowhide and pull it right down. But the wind come real fast, and it lifted him. <laughs> and for a tiny minute, he was the tail on a cowhide kite. <laughs> Did you know Laporte was originally called Kelowna? Did you know that Greeley was originally a thriving little stage station and residence area called Latham. Well, let me tell you about the Buckhorn Canyon. Now, you know that would be named for the animals with the buckhorns. But Stowe Prairie, I would like to tell you about Stowe Prairie. There was a couple of men one real nice day, and they're hiking up the Buckhorn Canyon. And when they get clear up to the top, and it kind of flattens off. They turned and they went north just a little bit. And the grass was up and over their shoulder. And the trees were so pretty. The flowers were in bloom. The sky was so nice. And one of the men said, oh, I would just love to have my wife see this. Nobody else has ever walked here before. And the second man fell over a stove. Well, so what, said the first man, we'll call it Stowe Prairie. Now, Elizabeth lived to the ripe old age of 95. And when she was 90, we believe she had a stroke. She lived with her daughter, Theodosia Van Brunt, 
in the house on Howe Street, and uh, she wasn't well. They pushed her in a wheeled chair. I didn't say wheelchair. This is a chair with wheels. A wheeled chair out on the front porch, and she would sit with her black dress and her little dust cap on her head, and she would greet her friends. Well, in 1893, Wyoming gave ladies the vote. And in 1894, Colorado said ladies could vote. Now, the men were so mad about it, they said the ladies were too dumb to vote. <laughs> they didn't know who would be a good person to vote for. And plus, which the husbands mainly were Republican, and they would vote like their husbands did, and that would make more Republicans in Fort Collins. But it didn't make any difference. The ladies voted. And Auntie Stone, in the wheeled chair, was pushed by her son to the polls, and she voted. Now, Auntie did not believe in liquor in any form. She thought anything you put inside yourself that made you act differently was wrong. So, of course, you know she wouldn't vote for a mayor. She voted for the mayor that stood for temperance, meaning he wouldn't allow any liquor in Fort Collins. But not everybody agreed with her. November 18. 95, she voted again, a very fragile old lady, pushed to the polls. And she voted for Frederick Baker, who ran on a temperance ticket, and that was Dick Baker's grandfather. And he was elected mayor. And from the time he took office, in 1896 to 1969, Fort Collins went prohibition. There was to be no liquor sold in Fort Collins. Dick Baker's grandfather. And he was elected mayor. And from the time he took office, in 1896 to 1969, Fort Collins went prohibition. There was to be no liquor sold in Fort Collins. Well, we had uh, Auntie died then, December 5, 1895. Flags were at half-mast all through town and all the businesses. There was a long people procession going out to Grandview Cemetery where she's buried. Only they called it Grandview. And she is buried in the Van Brunt section. It's the E section. If you've seen the uh, firemen across the way, they're just this way. And it looks like a park because it's four-sided. And she has the side that faces the east. And all it says on it is Auntie Stone died December 5, 1895, aged 94 years. And every stone that you see will tell who they were or something about them. But they thought there'd never come a time when people didn't know who Auntie Stone was. Mm -hmm.